What's up guys, Doug Polk here, and today we're going to be taking a look at a hand from the big game between Daniel Negreanu and Phil Locke. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Oh, he had trips? He had trips. So why are you bragging about that exactly? Oh, it was a fun yeah. pot. I went <laughs> raise. He's like, I called Durr with bottom pair and he had three of a kind. I got the re-raise in with the 6-9 and he got the re-raise in with the 10-jack. That's how it started. We've got Phil Locke limping in, Tony G coming over the top for 3,000, and Phil Helmuth mulling it over. These two are about to battle in the sandbox again. What's happening, Phil? I don't know, oh. Tony. I'm, he might have it this time. I don't know. Tony's talk may finally be getting to Phil. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. What do I know? Ernest Wiggins has folded. Daniel straddled this hand. He's in at a discount if he likes. And he likey likey. Pretty loose call from Daniel. He may feel like he has the right odds with this many players in the pot. And Phil Locke joins the party as well. So we've got four players on the flop. Our hand begins at 400-800 with Phil Helmuth complaining about a bad beat. It's nice to get to the human side of Phil every now and then. Anyway, Phil Locke decides to limp into the pot with Ace-3 suited. You guys know the drill by now. You should never be doing this. First into the pot, if the action's on you, unless it folds to the small blind, you come in for a raise, you refold your hand, and Ace-3 suited is no different. Tony G's on the button here with Queen-10 offsuit, and he decides to go ahead and isolate Phil Locke's limp. I can't say that I'm a huge fan of this. Generally speaking, when you have hands like offsuit, weak broadways like this, and you're facing limps, you're going to be behind against the range of hands that chooses to continue. You could get 3-bit by the blind who think you're isolating this guy light. You could still get limp re-raised. And then on top of it, you're not even ahead of the ranges of hands that will continue from the cutoff. So not a big fan of this play overall. Now, maybe Tony thinks that his opponents are exceptionally weak and he wants to build a pot against them. But I don't think that's the case in this exact instance. In the small blind, Phil Helmy looks down at King Jack offsuit. I think this is a spot where you probably want to either three better fold, but he does decide to make the call. Dan Negriner looks down at 7-6 offsuit in the big blind. I don't mind him coming along for a flop, which he does decide to do. And now the action's back over to Phil Locke. Now, I don't know what Phil's strategy with his limping is going to be, but if you are going to implement limping into your strategy, you should sometimes have hands like aces or kings in there so that you can limp re-raise and then work in some bluffs. Hands like wheel suited aces are some of the nicest hands to be able to bluff because you now, you now know it's much less likely your opponent has an ace in their hand because you have one. Additionally, if your opponent does have a strong hand like queens or nines, you have a lot of equity against those holdings. So wouldn't mind seeing Phil come in for the limp free raise, but he does decide to call and let's take a flop. Could see some chips get in the middle here. Deuce, four, six, two spades. Daniel's flop top pair with sixes. However, Phil Locke has flopped gut shot straight and the nut flush draw. Even though he doesn't have a made hand yet, he is the statistical favorite to end up with the best hand. Phil Helmuth has checked over to Daniel. Makes it 6,500 to go. When you hit top pair with sixes, there are any number of scare cards that can come off on the turn. Daniel's betting here to protect his hand by thinning the field. With a draw this strong, Phil Locke is not going anywhere. Makes the call. Tony G folds. Tony, why do you get us some trouble like this? It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it, Phil? 6-4 deuce with two spades, and we have a pretty decent flop for two of our players. Negroni moves into the lead with his top pair, but it's actually Phil Locke with the most chance to win this guy with a gutter and the nut flush draw. Helmuth checks his king high, and this is where our hand starts to go off the rails a little bit. Negreanu now decides to lead with his top pair into this four-way flop. I don't like this play. I would say, generally speaking, when you call a, an open pre-flop, you should check it over to the pre-flop raiser. Now, Negreanu likely thinks that Tony G is raising too many hands on the button wide, which is probably true given the queen-10 here. Helmuth would three-bet with some of his better hands, which is also true some of the time, although we definitely see Helmuth trap, and that Phil's range is pretty weak when he just limped called. But... The thing about this hand is that there are essentially no good turns from you, for you. If you get action anywhere, you're going to be scared of pretty much any turn that's not a 7 or a 6. This also starts to beg some larger picture questions. What does Negreanu's range look like when he does decide to check? 
Well, if he's going to lead his top pairs, now he's much weaker when he does check. And one of the things you can do against players doing this is when they do check, you bet smaller amounts more often to put them in tough spots. If someone can't have top pair when they check, then their range will become more polarized, and in that situation, it makes more sense to bet small. Now over to Phil Locke, definitely an interesting spot here with the nut flush drawn a gutter. I don't mind a mix of raising and calling. I lean a little bit more towards raise because your hand just has so much equity, and that way you really knock a couple other players out of the pot. If he just calls here, you allow people behind to come in with hands like pocket sevens or ace four suited. And I think you want to make those hands fold so you can just isolate Negrani's lead. It is also good to have some strong draws when you call though. So I don't mind this decision every once in a while. The other two players get out of the way and let's take a turn. Ace of hearts. Now, Chris, I did forget to mention the ever present top pair draw. <laughs> Locke now has the lead. Daniel looks like he's ready to fire away again. A bet of 14,000. He obviously doesn't have a good read on the strength of Locke's hand. Now, even though Locke is a weak kicker, it's unlikely he'd fold to one bet after making top pair here in the turn, not to mention all the draws he still has. Right now you're in silent mode. Kind of scared this, a little bit. Can I get the chatter to come in? What do you want me to say exactly? I'm a little scared, to be honest with you. It's like a lot of bad things could happen here. You could have me beat. You could get there, you could bluff me, all that kind of stuff. You can have ace five of spades. You can have six four. You got like two eights, I guess. Or exactly. <laughs> Phil's trying to get a read on Daniel. Daniel's bet into him twice. Even though he's a strong draw, Phil's hand is in jail to any bigger or smaller ace. There's the call. Daniel can't be too comfortable with that. The turn comes the ace of hearts giving Phil Locke top pair and he moves solidly into the lead. At this point, Negreanu has no choice but to check because betting would accomplish actually nothing. Anything stronger than a six would continue. Anything weaker would fold. So betting makes no sense at all. Negreanu does decide to go ahead and bet 14,000. Now the action's over to Phil Locke. This spot gets kind of interesting, and this is something that if you're newer to poker, or even if you're not new to poker, I would strongly advise against from both players. If you engage in table talk about what your hand is, you risk giving away information. Now, if you're a seasoned veteran of the felt, or you're extremely good at it like some players are, then yeah, you can talk and maybe get into it. But you're going to kind of give things away about what your hand strength is. Both conversation or both sides of the conversation here are pretty interesting. Negranu is being very honest about what his hand is and what could happen, and Phil Locke is being very deceitful when talking about the ace of spades. Once the chitter chatter dies down, this is a spot where Phil Locke simply has to call. Raising would not make sense at all. He's got a very strong hand, but if he gets re-raised when he raises the turn, he's going to be behind his opponent. So Phil does eventually decide to call, and let's take a river. Ten of diamonds. Neither player's hand improves here. Daniel's been the aggressor all along. He can only win this hand now with a bluff. He makes it 25-5 to go. So you have six deuce. Or ace ten of spades. You have ace ten of spades. <laughs> so random. Ace four of spades. That's what you got. Ace four of spades. I'm such a fish. I'm a fish. God, I'm a fish. The river is an offsuit 10, which is a brick for both players. Now, Negreanu has deduced, given the conversation on the turn, that his hand is no longer good. So even though I'm not a fan of his turn play, he does seem to know kind of where he's at in the hand now. And he knows his only chance to win this guy is to take it down with a bluff. But this is why you don't take hands like top pair and turn them into this line. It simply doesn't make sense to do. As far as what size Negrani should go for here on the river, I wouldn't mind seeing a pretty big bet. Generally speaking, when you bet earlier streets and you get to the river and you either are going to have a very strong hand or a bluff, you want to pick big sizes to put middling hands in your opponent's range in a tough spot. Negranu does decide to go for a bit of a smaller size, betting only half pot. Not a terrible bet size by any stretch, but I'd like a bigger one so that we can be more aggressive with our opponent. Over to Phil with top pair, he's not really in a great spot. His opponent is saying that he has two pair or better, so his top pair really only wins if he's up against a bluff. Another thing that Phil could consider here on the river is that having the three of spades is a bad card. 
if Negranu was bluffing, it could absolutely be a hand like 7-3 of spades or king-3 of spades or some of those suited hands that called preflop and then decided to make a move. It would be it would be worse to have a 5 in your hand because then your opponent, you, you would block your opponent from having hands like 7-5 or 8-5 straight draws, which could be bluffing here. And so you definitely wouldn't want to call with one of those cards. But even with the 3 of spades, you could maybe make the argument this isn't the exact hand you'd want to call. You also have to compare, though, this hand versus hands like 7s or 8s. 7 seems like a completely terrible hand to call because you block 7-5, you block 8-7, you block maybe the spades as well if you have the 7 of spades. So this hand is better than those hands when it comes to a call, but worse than a hand like, say, queens. And this is an important concept to think about when analyzing river calls. It's not just how strong your hand is, it's what's your removal like. If you have red queens here, you never block any of your opponent's bluffs, and so that makes a much better call than a hand like ace-5 with the 5 of spades or pocket sevens. Now, this is a spot that maybe Phil could let go, but can he figure out what Negranu's up to? Why do I want to call you? Because I'm a fish. I'm a fish. I'm a fish. Daniel's fired three times in this hand, this time for 25,000. Locke's got one pair and a weak kicker. An easy call to make for a bad player, a tougher call for a good one. You know I have something, but you know I'm tight. I feel like I'm being just totally owned. He makes the right call. Sixes. That's good. You had the ace of spades in. Yep. Good in. When you said that's, I have ace four spades. That was tricky. I, was, <laughs> I thought it might be a little tricky. Thanks for joining me today. And if you're interested in improving your poker game, check out upswingpoker.com.